Australia has welcomed nearly a million migrants, of whom half are British. Half have come from other European countries to take their place in the community with us. They're learning our language, they're working beside us, serving in a most practical way their apprenticeship to Australian citizenship. I'm looking now at uh, the buildings that were put here. Uh, I think it would be in about 1948 or at least 1949. They were here when I came into politics. Uh, this was the migrant, first migrant hostel established and in this place here came the refugees from war-torn Europe uh, who regarded this probably as a paradise compared with what they had been accustomed to just a few months before in their own country. And uh, it started actually the migration flood of population into, uh, into this state. on Europe, homeless people are still restless and on the move. These are the innocent victims of war, the displaced persons. My first memories in my childhood start during bombing raids in the Ukraine. We lived in Zaporozhye, which is a city uh, not too far from Kiev, the capital of the Ukraine. My father was away at war. He was a sa um, the, the leader of a sapper division in the Soviet army. He was an engineer. And my mother and I remained with uh, my grandparents in Zaporozhye. My, fa my grandfather was a clergyman. Um, and my mother, being the daughter of a clergyman, didn't have a very easy time growing up in the Soviet Union. In the autumn of 1942, we went west because the Germans were retreating and there was no future for us in the Soviet Union. And we ended up in Leipzig, in eastern, what is now the eastern zone of Germany, um, in a labor camp. The ever-increasing number of refugees pouring into West Berlin from the Soviet zone presents a big problem, especially from the point of view of housing and feeding them. Here in the Neukölln district, an empty factory has been pressed into service. 4,000 refugees, men, women and children, together with all the belongings they could bring, have taken up residence in it. People have been fleeing from the east in their thousands, whether through fear of the new Russian regime or for whatever reason, as fast as one large group is accommodated, more come in to be registered. You know, Europe uh, was in a turmoil, of course, with the, uh, with the war. Uh, there had been prison camps and concentration camps right through Europe. Uh, and so we had here those who were selected, who had applied. We had uh, the government of the day had uh, special representatives going into the camps and uh, selecting those who would be suitable for Australia. Five years we have been the peace. This day it is possible that we become again people. The doctors are satisfied. Our papers have been checked by security. Now only we have the final test, the interrogation by Australian consul. Ask the applicant how many years primary education. Wie lange waren Sie in der Volksschule? Vier Jahre in der Volksschule. Four years primary school. Secondary schooling. Und Gymnasium? Acht Jahre in Gymnasium. Eight years high school. Now, has he, has he any diplomas? Haben Sie welche diplomas? Ja, habe ich. This diploma was gained in Poland. Uh, what's it all about? Haben Sie diesen Diplom in Poland bekommen? Yes, Und yes, in Poland. Uh, He's a civil engineer. Civil engineer, uh, qualified civil engineer. Yes, sir. Sind Sie qualifiziert? Yeah, yeah. Has he never had any police convictions? Sind Sie nie verurteilt worden? Nein, nie. No, Mr. Grant. He never was sentenced. Where did he come to Germany? 1944. From where? From Limburg. 
Why didn't they register before for Australia? Warum haben sie sich nicht früher nach Australien registriert? Ja. Sich zu entscheiden für die Zukunft, für uns, für unser Kind, ist nicht so leicht. It is, it is not so easy to make up the mind for the future and for the child. You understand, because of the housing position, you may be separated from your husband when you reach Australia. As soon as he gets accommodation for you, you may join him. Yes, I understand well, but what can I do? But I hope we were, we have been separated for some time in the past. And I hope this time it will not last very long, Mr. Consul. That's all. Thank you very much, sir. Goodbye. Good luck. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. It was tinged with compassion uh, as well uh, for their conditions, but nevertheless, there was at the same time a very, very keen outlook on who would fit into this uh, a new country uh, as they did. And so there were Poles and Hungarians and Czechoslovakians and Dutch and German, uh, combined, of course, with uh, a fair quota of English migrants as well. The liner Orion on her first peacetime voyage brings a party of British tradesmen to help the Commonwealth rebuilding program. The boys are met by the Minister of Immigration and Information, the Honourable A.A. A. Corwell, who points out Sydney's view. <laughs> Fine types of workers who have come to help an empire mission. Fruits plentiful here, lad, and the band can play of the roast beef of old England without making your mouth water in vain. Some step among strangers. Some were here previously on war service. While others meet loved ones. The Minister for Migration congratulates an engaged couple, then welcomes the whole party. Well, very welcome. As new Australians, in our Australian community. We want to see more of your type coming to these shores to help to build up the homes that Australians want and that you yourselves will want too later on. We trust that you will settle down in Australia marrying Australian girls or girls from the old country. We want hundreds of thousands of men like you and we want many, many thousands of young women too who will come with you to uh, join uh, their fate and uh, your fate uh, will our destiny in this land so far from Europe, but so important a part of the British Commonwealth of Nations. Whatever else might be said about his administration, he must take the credit as the uh, empire builder in regard to immigration. It was him who went and uh, just after the war, 45, went to England and set up the immigration policy. Uh, he, uh, of course, went to America and appealed for a million migrants. And I understand the officers with him said, why not 100,000? He said, who'll listen to 100,000 in America? You've got to talk in millions. But he was responsible then for sponsoring and building up that program. Australia House London is the gateway to Australia, land of the future. The need for more Australians is obvious. The old world speaks of the troubled far east. For us, it is the very near north. Teeming millions are on our doorstep, while we Australians are so few. The figure I set for 1949 was 110,000. But that figure was exceeded at the end of August in this year. The figure I have now set for 1949 is 150,000. The Commonwealth Government is determined that its migration plan shall succeed. If we are to survive as a nation, it must succeed. Yes, Australia before the war had been a, a tiny, isolated, and not really markedly successful country. And like all such countries, of course, it, it knew that Australians were God's chosen people, so that any migrant was to some extent inferior. The British weren't too bad. So long as they didn't have too much of a pommy accent, you know, that didn't go down too well here. Scottish accents were very welcome, and so were Irish. It's quite interesting. Uh, but there was prejudice against people from the British Isles, 
and prejudice even more against people from other parts of Europe. I suppose if you wanted to be simple-minded about it, you could say that the prejudice increased the further you got away from Anglo-Saxon cultural backgrounds. E.g. the Dutch were tolerated, the Germans not quite so much, after all they'd been on the other side during the war, but as you went to Slav peoples, and as you went south of the Alps to the Mediterranean, prejudice seemed to increase. And it's odd that there was prejudice against Italians and Greeks, they'd been coming here for many, many years and had very successful communities. It was wrongly described as a white Australia policy, but there was nothing in our legislation to say that, but that was the accepted fact that we would be kept a European country with certain restrictions on the entry of non-Europeans. Now this wasn't confined to Cornwall. Uh, people of all parties in that generation thought very firmly of this, which came out of exploitation of uh, non-Europeans in Queensland, the Kanakas and others in days gone by, and a very humane background to the opposition where they didn't want to see them uh, be exploited. But he quite definitely upheld it uh, to the limit. And, uh, but he wouldn't, uh, it was not unusual in the Chifleys, the Curtins, the Liberals and others all uh, supported that policy, but he did run into a lot of uh, trouble over it. There was the famous Manila girl cases where he wouldn't let them in, you know, and that caused a great uproar. Then, of course, his famous statement in the House where they asked why one Chinese uh, couldn't get in when another one had, and he made that famous statement, two Wongs don't make a white. <laughs> <laughs> well, he never lived that down. That chased him to the grave. But that's what orators say, you see. This was his answer in the Parliament, flippantly. The term white Australia policy was a term that the Australian government kept saying, kept denying. It said, we do not have a white Australia policy. We have a policy of migration that, of course, we're restricted immigration. Uh, but that term was not used. But, of course, it was used by everyone in the country, uh, although not by the government officially. It was used by people abroad uh, because Australia's policy was definitely discriminatory against people who were not of Caucasian uh, origin. So Chinese, Indians, Negroes, uh, they were not welcome. But nonetheless, a lot of people at that stage did come here from Asia. They came as students. Uh, there were certain government schemes, such as the Colombo Plan, that, that brought people uh, from many Asian countries. Many of them, of course, grew away from their families and their home countries while they were here, and since the Australian government wouldn't let them stay, they suffered a great deal at the end of their courses. Uh, they could get better jobs here than they could at home. They were often denied opportunities at home for racial reasons back home. They faced racial prejudice both at home and here in many cases. Australia has too few people, not enough workers of many types. Workers for the offices, workers for the factories, workers for the city and workers for the land. To maintain and develop its bountiful resources, Australia needs more population. Natural increase is not enough. He may harvest the crops of the future, but not now. To get more people quickly, Australians through their government began in 1945 a program of planned, balanced immigration. They helped to pay the fares of the migrants. They set out to attract workers with the skills the nation needed. Today, Australia is reaping the rewards of this careful planning. On some assembly lines, well over half of the workers are migrants. Their production has saved Australia a hundred million pounds a year in imports. Steel production is an index of a nation's industrial growth. And the great post-war development of Australia's steel industry could not have occurred without the labor and skill of migrants. All over the country, migrants are working, working in full partnership with Australians, working with Australians to speed communications, to extend and improve transport, working at the great task of building a nation. Because we were from the Soviet Union, and because there had been no 
previous migration by people from the Soviet Union, uh, by uh, Ukrainians or Russians or Poles, uh, to Australia, we found that there were, were no established networks into which we, um, as new arrivals, could, uh, could plug into. Then we arrived in Bondagilla, which was more camps. The men and the women were divided again, women and children in one set of barracks, men in another. And we stayed there for three months. My father, who'd come out on the usual two-year contract on which all working people came to, to Australia, if they were displaced persons and coming out as migrants at that time, went to work as a waiter and a kitchen hand at the Pakopanyal Army Centre. My first memory of Fitzroy come, comes after my father left Bona Gill in the middle of the night with my mother pregnant and came to Fitzroy and found this Greek gambling um, place. And he walked in and saw all the food and the money and said to the guy, look, I've got no money. Um, I want you to give me 10 pounds and I need a place because my family's outside and they've got nowhere to sleep. And these two gamblers got up from the table and said, look, we've got a place in Fitzroy. So my first memory um, is walking down Young Street where the commission flats are now and uh, going up to this cast iron um, gate and walking in and it was on the first floor and it was in one room and the five of us lived in there for about six years. Uh-uh. Foreigners can't speak English. That makes it awkward. Come. That take a gesture. That comes in. Yes, please. Excuse. I'm going to publicate. Him, Osim, Shest, Dva, Yede. Huh? Oh, foreigners. Well, what flavor do you want? Excuse. Excuse. Yeah, thank you. To je hrozne. Shed bim spatki doma. Yeah. You think they'd learn to talk English, wouldn't you? Yeah. I can't stand them. <laughs> you get used to it. There's more of them coming out every day. Yeah, that's right. Every day. I don't know why they have to come out here anyway. You don't know why they have to come here. Well, they don't have to. This happens to be one place that really needs them. Here, get a hold of these. Let's see how you get on in a foreign country. Come on, Bob. Might do some good in here. Come on. Oh, all right, give it a go. Come on, Bob. Ask the girl. Oh, why don't you ask her? Uh, go on. They might have a phone here themselves. Go on. She said you plot to save you. Excuse me, miss. Have you got a telephone here? Uh, you know, uh, huh? Telephone. Me mon pour salver qui on me have. No, no, telephone. You compre? Hello, hello. Hello, hello. No, no. You know, telephone. Ring up. Oh, jeez. Come on, Bob. These characters will tell you nothing. You'd think some of them would learn to talk English, wouldn't you? Australian, Aborigine. The first thing that struck me was the Australian smelt. They used to smell differently. I used to walk into their houses and there was this sort of fattiness in the air. The other thing I noticed was that the radio was always on, um, in particular, always on the races. And their food was very... Well, very simple, put it that way, because it was always deep fried and there was sort of lard, I think, or dripping or something like that was being used at the time. I can't remember. For the people uh, who were living here, uh, it was a tremendous change. You see, uh, we'd had largely an Anglo-Saxon background. Uh, foreign languages were seldom heard. They were a source of interest and sometimes... Uh, a disdain uh, when they were heard. But uh, 
suddenly we had this tremendous influx uh, and uh, to the credit of the Australians they accepted with very good grace. I think uh, I think they admired immediately their fortitude and the way that they knuckled down to the job here in, Aust in Australia. You were brought up in a Greek culture for a start and the only language you spoke was Greek. So by the time you hit the streets or the schools um, you didn't know the language and by not knowing the language you immediately assume that you're dumb. Right. Like when I was, when I was in uh, sixth grade, 